Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon and welcome to the post 50. How do we know when to hold the course and how do we know when to adapt? This of course is nearing the end of our coaching series and this is an evocative and provocative question. It's really a question about the art and the craft of life. There's no empiricism, there's no science that we're going to summon this week. Instead, we're going to explore when is the right time to change course, to adapt, to move to something different, and when should we just continue to trudge through the vagaries of life? When do we stop? When do we change? When do we adapt? Now, this is always going to be, I think, a challenging life problem. While there have been humans, working out when to change and adapt has always been a struggle. But it's particularly bad now, and I'll tell you why. At the moment, we've got all these bonkers neoliberal vocabularies that are encircling around us, that are confusing us, and not allowing us to think clearly about the nature of our lives and our goals. Words like agile, pivot, disruption. Whenever we hear agile, pivot and disruption, to be frank, we need to be cautious. We need to be aware and we need to know that someone is trying to render us a guest star in our own lives. You see, whenever someone in a polyester suit often says agile, pivot, or disrupt, we should be aware, but we should also be concerned. And yes, we probably should be frightened because neoliberal management language for nearly 30 years now has kept the workforce, indeed has kept citizens worried, frightened, on the back foot, never quite sure what's going on. And we've seen restructures, redundancies, and of course, endless crises and chaos. So exploitation of human beings is based on the construction of vulnerability, of difference, of fear, and of worry. And you see, that's the point of neoliberalism, to keep us all a bit unstable, to keep us all just a little bit frightened. So when we're in this sort of situation, we not only question ourselves, we question our very rendering of reality. So I think in the last 10, 20 years in particular, there's been a sort of celebration of change for change's sake, disruption, simply for disruption's sake and it's hurting people. It's hurting families and it's hurting institutions. So this is the vlog that is cautious this week in our coaching series, a moment to pause, reflect and think. I want us to engage in careful, kind, compassionate change. You see, our culture at the moment is simply validating change, disruption, often without any clear purpose. And I think that's what's worrying me the most. You see, the assumption is at the moment that change is always good and that change is always progress. Now, of course, this is an ideology and this is the ideology of neoliberalism that validates the individual over the group and choice and agency over security and respect. Through much of the last 200 years, I think, probably since the Industrial Revolution, really, there's been a confusion between change and progress. But there is nothing in intellectual, social, political or economic change that is intrinsically beneficial or useful. It may be, but there's nothing intrinsically in change that renders it benevolent. 
Therefore, in these unstable times, we have to know when we're going to adapt, when we are going to change, and when, you know what, we need to suck it up, princess, and hold the course. Continue to succeed and engage in our goals. So what I've done today, and this is, can I say, this has been very useful for me as well, can I say, I've configured 10 proxies for all of us to think about particular life moments and whether or not we should change, whether or not we should adapt, or whether we should continue walking resolutely to our goal. So let's do this. Proxy number one. Oh yeah, this is it. Ask why. My first and favourite strategy when I'm assessing the need for change, whether it's prof professional or personal, is to ask why. If someone is asking a team or an individual or an organisation to change, then we have a right to assess and to evaluate their explanation for that change. Now, obviously, if we're in a workplace, we are being paid to do stuff, even if it's ridiculous stuff, even if it is weird stuff. So if we're in the workplace and someone says jump, then yeah, we're paid to jump. But even in those circumstances, it is very important for us to ask why and listen carefully to the answers of the people that are enforcing that change because we learn a great deal about life and work and choice. You see, invariably, if a manager or a leader is invested in and with neoliberalism, then the change is occurring because change in and of itself is important. So they won't be able to summon any evidence or reasoning or argument why the change is important. It'll simply be sort of self-referential. We're changing because change is good. Change, yes, change. So change exists because it exists and therefore it's useful. So when we ask the why question and there's no concrete rationale for change beyond we are changing because it is a change, <laughs> then we need to, in the rest of our lives, hold our course. Yes, we have to fulfill our responsibilities at work. But at that point, you know, you have a goal and you keep walking towards that professional and personal goal because the change is occurring arbitrarily just because it's change. Ask why. Two, you lose agency and you lose power through the change. Oh, this is a big one. If it is clear that a change has been proposed only to unsettle you, to make you feel like you're not an expert in your own life, to make you feel small, then you know what? You hold the course towards your goal. We see so often, I think, in some of the diabolically dreadful leadership cultures that are in existence on the planet at the moment, that change and change management documents are in place and they're being used to block a reckoning of the failures of leadership. Best example of this, we're seeing this, can I say, in universities all around the world where there was a strategic plan and because leadership failed to deliver on the strategic plan, they've created another strategic plan to replace the previous one. OK, so this is the way to say change, change, change. This is the way for a leader to avoid scrutiny and to continue to implement change, 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 change without accountability. Okay, so if change and changes are being used to reinforce the curtain around a particular wizard, then know that this is not a functional or even a valuable change, but it's being used to increase the power of the powerful and reduce the power of everybody else. So you know what? Hold your ground and maintain your confidence. 
Three, change can be exciting if you want excitement. Can I say, I've been reading really against the literature this week. I read a good 100 articles, at least, that talk about change as being exciting. Change keeps you fresh. Yeah, keeps you moving, keeps you excited with life. And look, that is true. If you are feeling stale or unmotivated or you are in a rut, then a change in workflow, in patterns, in priorities is incredibly useful for you, no doubt about it. And if that's the case, please do adapt and please do change. So if you're feeling in a rut, then a change is a good idea to get you out of the rut. But the issue is, I know so many people, my friends, my colleagues right now, that are so overscheduled, they don't have time to scratch themselves. They've got a full-time job, they're studying, they've got full-time caring responsibilities, they're looking after their parents, and you know what? They're really not managing because they have responsibilities and they are accountable for them because they're grown-ups. So what is required, therefore, if you are one of those people living an overscheduled life? And the answer is, what you need is stability and security and predictability. If one part of your life kicks off, then the rest of your life is going to be kicked completely off balance. So you cannot have change in more than one domain of your life. This is the argument I'm proposing for your consideration this week. So if your family life is going through a fair amount of instability, then that's not the time to think, yeah, I'm going to change jobs as well. Let's do that. No. And look, if you want to freshen up your life through change, that's great. But work in one domain at a time. OK, so if you're moving through a difficult relationship, if your relationship is going through some issues, that's not the time to redecorate your kitchen. Trust me. So what you need to do, work on that domain, get that where it needs to be and ensure that the rest of your life is stable. So if you want to innovate, freshen up your career, do that, but make sure the rest of your life is reasonably calm. And look, if you're going, can I just have a bit of life and serenity and peace at the moment? And to be frank, after COVID, why wouldn't you want that? Then recognise that stability and security may be boring for some people. Certainly in the literature, the literature does not like people being stable. What change and rupture and dynamism. But, you know, if you just want to just to take a breath, have a cup of coffee or have a lie down, then, then, you know, you go and do that, right? And if you want to innovate a bit of your life, then make a decision on one bit of your life you want to innovate. Four, here we go. Ask the question, is the risk worth it? You really need to determine that any risk, any change you make in your life is worth what you could lose. Now, I know that's an unpopular question because we live in risky times and risky behaviour and influences and reality television and people doing weird things and being successful. And the trouble is, with that sort of arc and narrative, you never see the costs and the consequences when that risk backfires. We see a lot of success stories, but for a lot of my friends, they're doing amazing research, for example, on homelessness. So people that have taken a risk in their life had taken a bit of a chance and they've ended up homeless or they've ended up having whole family issues, family breakups and job losses. So instead of jumping into a fire and going, this is going to be exciting, disco inferno, assess your current reality. And remember, we're in the coaching series, assess the goal that you have configured for yourself and ascertain the risk to yourself and to your goal if you take on these other issues and make all these changes. Yes, managing risk is crucial. It's important. If we live a life, then we have to manage risk. But always think about what you may lose 
in this situation as much as what you will gain. So I need you to try and weigh the situation with evidence rather than emotion. Five, if you're stuck and unhappy, <laughs> change can enable movement. Now, sometimes we get stuck. We get stuck in bad relationships, bad jobs, or we just get ourselves into bad writing and research cycles, right? And the best solution, I think, in that case is to acknowledge that the situation is not working too well and change. And in that circumstance, the change takes incredible courage and grit, and you've got to use all the momentum techniques that we talked about last week. Therefore, a change, an externally imposed, if you will, opportunity, can rescue you from a bad situation, can scoop you out of a problem. And that's absolutely true. I've done it in my life, probably you have as well. Something bad's happened, an opportunity has occurred, it's scooped you out of a situation. But the only caveat that I would offer you with regard to sort of the scooping out or the parachuting strategy to get you into a different situation is that if you're in this situation because you have personal and professional issues, then unless you address those personal and professional issues, then they will follow you wherever you go in life. So you can change context, but you're still the same person. So the problems will reoccur. So yes, externally imposed changes can parachute you out of a bad situation. And sometimes that can be incredibly important. I'm thinking particularly in bullying environments. Often, sadly, the best way out of a bullying environment is to get out of the organisation. And that is incredibly sad. But the reasons in some circumstances that you're in this bad situation may still be present in the new context. So can I say most importantly, address those issues. Yes, it is easier to, to parachute yourself into a different circumstance, okay? And you know what? Sometimes you need easy. So do that if you have to or you want to, but be aware, spend some time thinking about what caused the problems in one context and heal it and resolve it in the next. Six, this is so important, six, be proactive rather than reactive. If there's any mantra for this century, I think it's this, be proactive rather than reactive. Change is being imposed top down by a whole series of pretty mediocre leaders at the moment. And it's being imposed top down on workforces. But part of the reason I think we started this coaching series at the start of this year is for all of us to establish our own goals, be proactive, and then learn how to take a step every day to move towards that goal. Change, sadly, for most of us is reactive. Someone tells us to do something and we have to do it. That's a reactive change. Now, if we're considering making a change, we need to try and be much more proactive in our lives. The key is to action change with evidence, with clarity and reasoning rather than emotion. So much on, of life is imposed on us and we simply react to what's happening to us. Now, I want you to think back, and I've done this work myself, think back on the last couple of years of your life. How many times were you reacting to something that your partner did, your kids did, your family did, reacting to the workforce, reacting to your PhD supervisor. How often did you actually commence a change by you making a proactive decision to commence that change? So when you are pondering a change from this point forward, think about, right, is this a reactive change or is this a proactive change? Seven. Remember that there are people around you that want to see you failing. <laughs> this is a tough maxim, but in our tough neoliberal workforce, competition is the punctuation of life. And know that there are people in your life, 
in your working environment, perhaps in your personal circle, that want you to fail. And of course, what's happening at the moment is we're going through this coaching series. So you have a goal and you're moving carefully and respectfully and responsively towards that goal. So the people around you are going, oh, you're becoming successful. Right, so you need to know therefore that there are people around you that are wanting you to fall over, to stumble, to fail. And they want you to fail for a single reason, and that single reason is so that they will feel better about themselves. Remember Morrissey's line, we love it when our friends, <laughs> or we hate it, we hate it when our friends become successful. What a great lyric, Odie Morrissey. So keep in control. Park your emotion and assess the evidence and don't assume that all the people around you want you to be successful because they don't. Now I've worked in I think nine workplaces at this point of my life and in every single workplace there was at least one and sometimes a lovely little cluster of people that would trip me over in the corridor if they could. So when you're thinking about change evaluate it for yourself rather than always listening to what other people are telling you is best for you. Don't assume that the people around you care for your interests. They probably don't. Eight, love this one, remember that you can stop what you're doing. Well, wow. I think that stopping is incredibly important. Let me explain. We all know those people, perhaps you're one of those people that sort of endlessly keep moving, keep changing, so they don't actually have to confront the reality of their lives, right? They just sort of keep moving and they're always busy, so they don't actually have to look in the mirror, yeah? So you're so busy that you never really ask the difficult questions about yourself. So change keeps you moving, but it often blocks your thinking. Sometimes a change is not needed. Sometimes stopping is what's needed. You often hear me talk about the value of thinking time, time where you can think, to be able to just sit and ponder and understand what is going on around you. But of course, our culture doesn't want you having thinking time. They want you in meetings and answering emails and ping, ping, ping notifications. All of that is there to stop you thinking. Therefore, instead of celebrating change, how about we celebrate stopping, even temporarily? So work out if you are today, hi, exhausted, angry, worried, bit frightened, how about you make a decision to stop just for one hour and go for a walk. Work out what you're feeling and why. Now, it may be time for a change. It may be time to change jobs. It may be time to have a proper conversation with one of your children about what's going on, right? It might be a tough conversation time. But don't change for change's sake to avoid making difficult decisions. Sometimes just stop. Don't think about the next thing. Just stop. Nine. The biggie. Change can cost you financially. Change is about power and the execution of power. And when we, as humble humans, make changes or they're enforced upon us, those changes cost us financially. You see, words like flexibility and adaptation require that we change. And these changes often involve moving, moving jobs, moving houses, moving cities, sometimes even moving countries. And this costs money. And look, if we have plenty of money, then changing is so much easier. But as I think we know from all our postdocs, 
that move from postdoc to postdoc to postdoc to postdoc and become permadocs, as we know from our casualised workforce, our precariat workforce, basically most of the population now is working to just about break even if they can. So change costs us. Stability is how we create financial security. Now, particularly in academic life at the moment, and I've got a lot of friends at the moment that are living an absolutely hellish life. They're working three and four different jobs. They're spending hours on the train each week. And a whole series of my friends at the moment to do all these multiple jobs are staying in Airbnbs or motels for three and four nights every single week. Can you imagine? So remember, before you consider any change, do a full economic costing of that change. And can I say, I got this idea when I was a very young person from my father, of course, who's just turned 95. And he always said to me, when you're thinking about a job, do the full economic costing. How are you going to get to work? What are you going to wear at work? What is it going to cost you to do that job? It doesn't mean that you don't do the job, but work out what is your income? What is it going to cost you? and does it balance, yeah? The unknown, while exciting, will cost you. And 10, recognize the value of a pivot before a change. Pivot has become one of those truly dreadful managerial words. And I think it's time that we reclaim this word back because pivots are interesting. You see, you know, pivot and agile, very different formations. But when we're assessing a situation and whether or not we should change, how about we pivot first? Because a pivot occurs, if you think about it, you've got one foot on the ground and it is stable and you move the other one a bit so you get a different view, a different vista. You see your life and the world in a slightly different way. So the pivot is predictable and it's safe and it gives you a little bit more information through which you can make a decision. So the problem, I think, is when we're in a crisis, and let's face it, most of the 21st century, we've all been living from crisis to crisis to crisis to crisis. You know, we might be working for a shouter. I love a good shout. We might be working for a diva. Love me a diva. And we might be working for someone who really shouldn't be allowed to go grocery shopping without going with a friend, right? So if every situation in our lives is a crisis, everything is urgent, then we start to lose the ability to slow down, to take a breath and interpret what is happening to us. So the next time someone tries to celebrate crisis and change and chaos, take a pivot instead. Don't sort of do a, a dummy spit resignation. Don't talk eh, behind their back. Don't do that stuff. Just pivot. Have another look at this situation from a different angle and see if it's real. See if there's evidence to back up what you think is occurring. Then, once you see the situation more clearly, you have options, and then you can make a change. So don't be rushed. Don't be hustled. Don't be worried. Pivot, have a good look, assess your options before you make a change, or you stop. So I know this week has been quite unusual, because I want you to be safe. And I want you to have time to achieve your goal. And at the moment, we've got so many mediocre people around us telling us what we need to be doing with our time and our life that we need to certainly watch fear in ourselves and procrastination in ourselves. But we also need to remember who we are and that our goals are important and we have a right to achieve them. Always remember the maxim from the post this week is the powerful gain from change. 
the powerlessness they tend to lose from change. So be clear who you are. What is your goal? And be proactive in achieving it rather than reactive to all these sort of t-shirt slogans that are pretending to be leadership. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.